Well, guys, I appreciate everybody. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Man, we've had a beautiful morning here at Cornerstone, and uh, just one thing missing, and that's you. But uh, we, I just want to bring to you the Word of God about, and of course, we'll be talking about resurrection, talking about the life of Jesus. And, uh, but I just want to begin with uh, the virgin birth of Jesus. Jesus was born of a virgin. That was a miracle. Uh, the Bible teaches us that then he grew up to become a man, and then he went about showing people how much God loved them. And he did that by feeding the hungry, he blessed the children, and he healed the sick. And uh, throughout the Gospels, it's amazing to me when you really look for it, of how often Jesus was healing those that were sick. Uh, he opened the eyes of the blind, he opened the ears of the deaf, he healed all that were sick. Even Peter summed it up and said how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. That's Acts 10, 38. And so Jesus was continually healing the sick. But today we're talking about the resurrection. And so from healing, we also see that Jesus even raised the dead. We see that throughout the scripture. Now, in, in John chapter 5, in John chapter 5, there is the recording there, a particular miracle in the life of Jesus that is a man that is uh, the King James, the old King James said he was an impotent man, meaning he had no strength. Uh, other translations said he was an invalid. Uh, so other translations describe it in different ways. But this man has been there by the pool of Bethesda. He's been there waiting for uh, 38 years. I'm sure he was there probably every single day waiting for the angel to come from heaven and stir the water. When all of a sudden Jesus walks in there and he, 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 he comes to the man in verse, verse 6 it says, in verse 5 said, Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, uh, and knew that he had already been there in that condition a long time. He said to him, do you want to be made well? So Jesus asked him, do you want to be healed? And, I mean, that's sort of a, a different question. I mean, most of the time people are talking about, about the will of God. Here Jesus said it's not the will of God. It's, it's whether your, your will is. What do you want? Jesus said, do you want to be made whole? The sick man answered him, gave him an excuse. He said, uh, when the angel comes and stirs the water, there's nobody to put me in. And so Jesus then looks at him and says in verse 8, he said to him, Arise, take up your bed, and walk. And the Bible says that the man instantly, the man instantly stood up. Immediately, verse 9, immediately he, he that was made well took up his bed and walked, and it was the day was the Sabbath. And so the man is wonderfully and gloriously healed. Hallelujah. Amen. Now that's just one picture in the life of Jesus. One picture in the life of Jesus. Now, when we talk about the life of Jesus, you have to understand that, that we're, we're reading a, a testimony here that actually happened. It actually happened. So we could say that was history. It happened in history. But, but since Jesus died and since Jesus rose from the dead, we can no longer see that as only history. We have to also see that, that that is a description of the kind of life that Jesus now has actually poured into us. It's the miracle healing life of Jesus. It's the same life. It's the same life. And so Jesus here is, uh, is, is the scripture here is giving us this, this testimony of the healing of this, of this man. Now, from that point in these scriptures, Jesus now begins to teach. And you have to see the teaching in John chapter 5 based upon the miracle that happened in that man's life. And so Jesus begins. And I'm going to read and make some teaching as I read, beginning with verse 17. The Bible said, but Jesus answered them. In other words, there's a persecution that's broke out because of Jesus healing the man and the man carrying his bed on the Sabbath day. And Jesus answered them and said, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. In other words, God has never stopped working. He's continuing to do and to work miracles continuously throughout time. And so what, what is Jesus talking about there? Jesus is giving a contrast between what took place 
in the layman's life and what had taken place in the past. In other words, he, the, the, the angel only come down at certain times. There was only certain seasons that someone could, could even expect to be healed. But Jesus now is revealing to them that God is continually working and Jesus says, I am continually working. And so in this thing of the healing and the resurrection life of Jesus, there are no seasons. It is a permanent thing. Ever since Jesus has risen from the dead, it is a permanent fixture in the kingdom of God. God is at work. Jesus is at work. The Holy Spirit is at work. Hallelujah. Amen. So let's continue. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, they said, but, he, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Now let's read on. Verse 19. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son of Man can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. But verse 20, But the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does and will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Now stop right there. Jesus now is, is beginning to talk about the future of his ministry. In other words, in the past up to now, if we only looked at the Gospel of John, what has Jesus done as far as the miracle stories in the Gospel of John? He, he's turned the water into wine. He has, uh, he's healed the nobleman's son. Now you have the, the man beside of the pool of Bethesda that was, uh, that was an invalid. Jesus has healed him. Now, Jesus says that you have seen these miracles. You've seen these things happen. And God is now saying that I'm going to do bigger and greater than that in order that you might marvel. Now, there's a spiritual principle there that I want to just touch on briefly. Notice the Bible said he will show you greater works than these that you may marvel. And, and the, the way to, to, to uh, stir up the way to stir up the grace of God, the way to stir up the power of God to do greater things in your life is to look at, see, and acknowledge even the small things that God is doing in your life. You look at those and you acknowledge those. Don't let those go by. You say, what are you talking about? Well, you can start just early in the morning and walk outside and look at the blue sky. And just acknowledge the grace of God for what God has done with, with the, the blue sky or the, or the clouds or, or the trees or the birds. I mean, some way to begin to look at and acknowledge God and what God has done. You acknowledge Him in creation. And then you begin to look in your life. And even the small things, sometimes here at the church we, we often talk about, you know, parking lot favor, how that, you know, we got the favor of God on us and, and it seemed like with that favor that every time we pull into the parking lot, man, there's, there's, a, there's a parking space right in the front. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. It's favor. And, and I tell you, I never miss an opportunity when that happens. It happens a lot to say, Lord, that's the favor of God. Hallelujah. Amen. I recognize that. And there's so many things that happen in your life. Man, I'll go down the highway and I'll hit a green light and I'll say, Lord, I praise God, I got green light favor. Hallelujah. I'm acknowledging the favor of God. Always acknowledging the favor of God. Everywhere I look, everything I can find, I acknowledge the favor of God. All of those things are small things. But listen, if you acknowledge the work and the favor and the grace of God in small things, God is going to say, wow, you like that? I'm going to show you something bigger than that. Hallelujah. You have set the stage for some bigger, awesome things to happen in your life. Now, if you walk around all day long with your head down, you don't see nothing good. The day is, uh, you know, the day is cloudy and, and you're all gloomy. I'm going to tell you what, you'll never even see when good comes. Amen. You'll never even see when good comes. Let me tell you, make a point here. You know, when this, uh, when this pandemic hit here, you know, and, and the crisis began, you know, there was a scripture that God gave me in Jeremiah chapter 17. And God said in Jeremiah chapter 17, you'll be like a tree planted by the river of water. And then he says in Jeremiah 17, he says, you will not see when heat comes, nor will you be careful in the day of drought. I made a decision right there when God gave me that verse. I was not going to be careful. Yeah, hallelujah. Amen. I was not going to be careful. What is careful? Careful means anxious. 
It means worrying. I determined I was going to move forward and do what God called me to do. Everything he called me to do, the way he called me to do it, I was going to be do it with all my heart. I mean, immediately, obviously, with the, the crash in the market and the economy and people unemployed, the first thing that comes to your mind is the economy. When I said, I'm going to do just exactly what we've been doing, we're going to support Zambia, we're going to support Pakistan, we're going to support India, we're going to do what God told us to do. Hallelujah. We're not backing up, we're not backing down an inch. Glory to God. And God said in Jeremiah 17, you will not see when heat comes. You will not be careful in the day of drought. He said, and your leaf would not wither. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Amen. I'm telling you today, Cornerstone, I mean, this, this thing, we're coming out of this bigger. We're coming out of this stronger. We're coming out of this more anointed and more on fire for God than we've ever been in our lives. Praise God. Say amen, somebody. Amen. amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. God says, I'm going to show you bigger things in order that you may marvel. Praise God. Say glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory. Now back to my verses there. Now go to verse 21. It said, for the Father, listen to this now, because now Jesus, it says, has prophesied, I'm going to do bigger things. Up till now, he's done the miracles I mentioned. He turned water to wine, healed the noble son, and healed this invalid man. Now, Jesus says God's going to show you bigger miracles so that you might marvel. So now Jesus is going to begin to speak to the future about his ministry, about the bigger things that he's going to do. He's now going to introduce the raising of the dead. Now, look at that. Jesus, at this point in his ministry, has never raised anybody from the dead. No one has been resurrected. But Jesus has been in tune with the Father, hallelujah, and he knows it's coming. Glory to God. See, amen. Said, For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. Praise God. Gives life to whom he will. Now put that up there in the, uh, in the old King James. I, I just need, the, I need the, the, the old King James up there on that screen. Because it says a little bit, a little bit different. Look at what it said. He raises the dead and quickens them, is what it says. The Father raises the dead and quickens them. New King James says he raises the dead and gives life to them. He raises the dead and gives life to them. One translation says he raises the dead and gives them life so that they may continue living. Now, I want to divide that. I want you to see two things there. Number one, God says he raises up the dead. There it is. The Father raises up the dead and quickeneth them. He raises the dead and quickeneth them. Now, there's actually two things there. He raises the dead and he quickens them. Quicken means to revitalize. It means to revitalize. It means that he gives them new life. Now, he's, in, in quickening them, he's not necessarily talking about dead people. He's talking about living people. Jesus is giving us an insight into how the invalid was healed. He was giving us insight into the power that actually made the invalid able to walk. What was that power? It was the life of God. It was the same life that raised Lazarus from the dead. It was the same life that raised up the, the, uh, the widow of Nain's son. It's the same life that healed Jairus' daughter. That's the same life that came into this invalid's body and gave new life to his bones, new life to his muscles, new life to his tendons. He received the life of God into his body. He wasn't dead, but he received the life-giving power of God into his body. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. So the Father, the Bible said, raises the dead and quickens them uh, quickens them, even so the Son quickens whom he will. So now Jesus is talking about the greater works. He says, let me just read on. He said, for the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in me, who sent me, has everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment, 
and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Again, Jesus is talking about life. He's talking about eternal life. Hallelujah. See, the thing with Christianity is not a different, simply a different moral code. You know, there are many religions in the world, and you can divide religions into different, uh, into different categories. And one of the categories of religion is a religion that only has rules. It's, uh, it's called a, 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 a morality code. It's, 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 it's only a way of living. Christianity is not that way. Christianity is a new kind of life. Jesus says that he gives us everlasting life, everlasting life. It is a new kind of life that changes us on the inside, and so therefore, in consequence, it changes the way we live. Amen? Amen. So Jesus is talking to us about, about the subject of life. Verse 25, most surely I say to you, the hour is coming and now is. Now, Jesus had said, I've done these works. He said, but God's going to do greater works. He's going to be more specific now. Verse 25, most surely I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Hallelujah. He said, I am going to raise the dead. Now, it's important today as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. We Historically, biblically, we know Jesus died on that cross. They drove nails in his hands, nails in his feet. Six long, agonizing hours he hung on that cross. But at the end of that, he cried, it is finished. And he said, Father, into your hand I commend my spirit. And he died. They took him off the cross. They buried him. Three days later, he raised from the dead. Jesus raised from the dead. Our faith is based upon, the huge part of that foundation is based upon a resurrection. It's based upon a resurrection from the dead. So it's a strange thing. It's an odd thing that there are Christians who do not believe in the supernatural. Because our faith is built upon a resurrection from the dead. Amen. Our faith is built upon a resurrection from the dead. Jesus was raised from the dead. He was dead for three days. Hallelujah. Amen. I mean, think about it. The Bible says that uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, the Bible says there, and it says, it says this, he said, God said, I pray that God would give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus. Then he says, in order that you might know, you might know. And he gives three things that he, God would have you to know. Number one, he would have you to know what is, the, what is the, uh, the, the hope of your calling. Amen. Number two, he would have you know. Uh, but number three, I forget number two. But number three, he would have you know what is the exceeding greatness of his power. He would have you know what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word that believe. So there is power that God has extended to us, and God wants us to know how big that power is. God wants us to see how big that power is. What is the measure of that power? How would we measure that power that God has extended to us? The only way to measure that power is to measure it because it, according to, he says, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Hallelujah. So when God raised Jesus from the dead, there was a working of God's power. And God says that power that was at work in Jesus when God raised him from the dead is the same measure of the power that God has given to you, that God has extended to you. Hallelujah. Amen. And I just want you to know that Jesus came out of the grave radiant with resurrection glory, radiant with resurrection power, radiant with it. And that power in and on Jesus has never faded. It has never faded. Think about the old covenant for just a minute. 
In the old covenant, there was Moses. Moses went up on the mountain, the mountain of Mount Sinai. And there he was with God for 40 days and 40 nights. And when he came off of that mountain, the Bible says that his face was shining. His face was glowing with the glory of God. So much so that the people could hardly look into his face. But there was a problem with that glow. There was a problem with that glory. And that is it was fading. Every day it faded. It it shone less and less and less. So so what did what did Moses do? Moses put a veil on his face. Why did he put a veil on his face? He didn't put a veil on his face so people couldn't see the glory. He put a veil on his face so they could not see the glory was fading away. That was in the old covenant. It would be the same thing if I took an iron, iron rod and I stuck it down in the fire. You know, when I grew up, we used to, you know, we used to make these stakes out of, out of rebar. And we'd build a fire, and we would uh, put that rebar down in that fire and keep it in the fire until, until the rebar turned red. And then take a hammer, and you could, bend the, you could bend the end of it all over, and so make you a nice stake you could drive in the ground. But think about that. You put that iron in the fire, and that, you pull that out, and that, that's, that iron stake is still glowing. It's still glowing red just like it was when it was in the fire. But you leave it out of the fire very long, and what happens? It fades. It fades. It diminishes until, until it returns back to normal. I just want you to know that is not the way it was with Jesus. That is not the way it is with Jesus. When Jesus came fresh, when he came new out of that tomb, full of glory, full of power, hallelujah. That same glory, that same power is on him and in him right this very moment, hallelujah. Glory to God. And the moment he knocked at your heart's door and you heard his voice and you opened the door of your heart, he, this glorious, this glorious, exalted son of God came into your life the same power that raised Jesus from the dead came into your life. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. So it is the, it is the exact same power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead. That same power is at work right this very moment. Hallelujah. Say amen. Amen. Glory to God. Now, go to the next verse, verse 26. I'm preaching just verse by verse this morning for a few moments. Verse 26, he said, For as the Father, listen to this phrase, For as the Father has life in himself. Let's stop right there. As the Father has life in himself. Notice that. The Father has life in himself. He is life. He lives totally independent of any and everything. He doesn't need to breathe. He doesn't need to eat. He is life. He is the very essence, the very substance of life. He has life in himself. He is the source, listen, he is the source of all life. He is the source of all life. He created, you could really, you could categorize it. He created vegetable life. He created animal life. He created human life. You know that story. The Bible said God formed man of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And when he did, Adam came alive. God, out of his life, created human life. Human life was created. Now, right there, I want to just share with you something about that. Because there are two different words in the Bible. There are two different Greek words in the Bible that are translated as life. There's actually four of them, but in this, this, this particular area, there are two. The first word is the Greek word suke. It is the Greek word suke, and it means just what the Bible said in, in, in the book of Genesis. When God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, he became a living soul. So suke means means breathing life. It means breathing life. So you could call that human life. So there is human life. And that human life is obviously the life that we have. We breathe, our heart beats, the blood pumps through our system, and and we're alive. We're alive with human life. We have human life. But then there's another kind of life That is a totally different Greek word that is used in the Bible, and that is the Greek word zoe. It's spelled Z-O-E. It is zoe. 
Zoe is the very life of God. The Bible says, Jesus said, as the Father has life in himself. What kind of life is that that is simply in God, that is totally independent of anything for, for, to live or to continue? It is the Zoe of God. It is the Zoe of God. It's, it's absolute life. It's the fullness of life, Strong says. Fullness of life. Hallelujah. And God out of Zoe created all life. He created all life. Amen. But when he created human life, when he created human life, he created human life in a very unique way in that he made the human life compatible with the life of God. Amen. He made that human life totally compatible with the life of God. So that when, you know, again, when God formed that thing out of the dust of the earth and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, the breath of God came into him. The spirit of God, the life of God came into him. Adam at that time was living with two kinds of life. He had human life, but he also had divine life. He had suke, but he also had zoe. Hallelujah. Amen. And he lived with Zoe in him. He lived in a place of dominion in the earth. He had the very life of God inside of him. Hallelujah. And because he had that life of God, he lived in dominion over the earth. Glory to God. And because of that, he never got sick. And he would have never died unless he had sinned. God said to Adam, Adam, in the day you eat of that tree, you will surely die. Well, we know the story. Adam took that fruit. He ate that fruit, but he didn't drop dead. Because after he ate the fruit, he's still, you know, he's still, uh, he's still breathing. He's still, his lungs are still working. His heart is still beating. He's obviously not dead. And he runs and hides and makes himself a coat of fig leaves. He's not dead. God said, in the day you eat, you shall die. In the day you eat, you shall die. Then later, in Genesis 3, he's having a conversation with God. And then if you turn to Genesis chapter 4, he's having children. He and Eve are conceiving children. What do you mean, in the day you eat, you shall die? Well, the fact is, is that the moment he sinned, Zoe went out of him. The life of God went out of him. And the human life that he had was corrupted by sin. And that's where sickness came from. It came from the corruption of sin in the human body that started with Adam in the Garden of Eden. So man lost the life of God. He lost the life of God. Now from that point, it became the intention of God by redemption to restore to us God's life, to restore to us the very life of God. Hallelujah. So the Bible says here that God, the Bible says now that God has life in himself. So he sends his son Jesus. Why did Jesus come? Jesus said that he had come in order that we might have life, John 10.10. 10. He said the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. He said, but I am come that you might have life. That word life is not suke. We, were, we, already, we got born, we already had suke, we already had human life. But Jesus came to restore to us zoe. He came to give us zoe. Zoe is the life of God. It is the absolute fullness of life. It is life as God himself has it. God came back to restore to us that life of God. Amen. Glory to God. Glory. So, but let's read on here. Look here. You got to see, see this. So Jesus said, verse 26, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Now, look at this now. He's given to the Son to have life. Now, if we put that up there in the New Living Translation, in the New Living Translation, it says this. It says that God has given to the Son God has given to the Son 
life in himself. But I'm going to give you another translation. God has given to the Son the same life-giving power. He has given the Son the same life-giving power. Or it is also translated in another translation, it is the power to impart life. Now, Jesus, Jesus is, is God from eternity, number one. But when he came into this earth, he became a man. In the incarnation, we see God and we see man. Jesus is not 50% God and 50% man. The miracle of the incarnation is that Jesus is 100% God at the same moment, he's 100% God. Excuse me, he's 100% man. He's 100% God and he's 100% man. But what God, Jesus does, according to Philippians chapter 2, he lays aside that glory and he lives his life on this earth as a man. He ministers, according to the Bible, as a prophet. So every, people say, well, you know, Jesus could steal the storm because he was God. Jesus could walk on the water because he was God. Jesus could, could, could turn water wine because he's God. That's not true. Jesus did nothing because he was God. He laid aside that glory, and he lived his life as a man, filled with the Holy Spirit, totally submitted to the Father, anointed of God. So now the Bible says, as the Father has life in himself, now the Father has given to the Son. Now, there's your proof. I mean, Jesus is living as God. God, Father, don't have to give him anything. <laughs> He's already got it. But as the man Christ Jesus, God gave to the Son the power to or the right to have life in himself. What is that life? What is that life? That life is Zoe, the same life that was in the Father. God has put that same life in the Son. Now, these translations said that life is, is life-giving power. It is the power to impart life. Hallelujah. Jesus is saying that he is getting ready to raise the dead. He is getting ready to raise the dead. He has received this life. And because he has this life, he says the dead are going to hear the voice of the Son of Man. They're going to hear the voice of the Son of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. So what does Jesus do? Jesus then continues his ministry. And it's not long after that. It's not very long after that something happens. All of a sudden, there's a, there's a, there's a ruler of a synagogue that comes running into the crowd where Jesus is. You can see him. He's, he's upset. He's, he's emotional. His baby, his, his little daughter is dying. And he comes to Jesus and finally gets an audience with Jesus. And he said, Jesus, come quickly. My daughter is dying. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us what her problem was. She was probably some fever had a hold of her, and she's dying. And so Jesus begins the journey on the road to see, to see Jairus. What's he going to do? It's going to be the first time in the Scripture that Jesus is actually going to use this life-giving power given to him by the Father. Hallelujah. And so there he goes, on his way to see Jairus. Now, something interesting takes place. What happens? The woman with the issue of blood comes through the crowd and grabs a hold of the hem of Jesus' garment. And when she does, the Bible said virtue comes out of him, and she is healed. She is healed of that problem she's been suffering with for 12 long years. Hallelujah. Now, what's on Jesus' mind? What's on Jesus' mind? He's, he's on his mind is going there to do what? Raise up Jairus' daughter. Because in the middle of all of that, what happens? Servants arrive and say, don't trouble the master anymore. Your daughter is dead. Jesus immediately responds and said, fear not. Only believe. Only believe. But there's this woman who distracts the whole process and touches the hem of his garment and she's healed of this plague. Notice what happens there. Jesus has on his mind to go to Jairus' house and raise this little girl from the dead. But the woman comes in and touches the hem of his garment. Hallelujah. And she's completely healed. What healed her? 
Now, I could take you through the text and prove it to you, but let me say this. What healed her? That same power, that same life-giving power that was going to raise that little girl from the dead was the same power that flowed out of him and caused that woman, that, that woman to be healed of that, of that issue of blood that she'd suffered with for 12 years. Amen. So if we embrace, listen, if we embrace resurrection, if we believe in resurrection, we got to embrace it all. We got we got to embrace it all. We got to believe it all because it's like, you know, it's a very simple thing. I mean, it's like if uh, if I've got $100 in my pocket, if I've got $100 in my pocket and that item cost me 10 bucks, and can I afford the $10 item? Absolutely. So if Jesus can raise the dead, if Jesus has resurrection power at work in him, amen, what is an issue of blood? It's nothing. It's nothing because it's the same life. It's the same quickening. The father raises the dead and quickens just like he did the impotent man, just like the invalid laying there by the pool of Bethesda. It's the same life that comes into us, into our bodies, and we're healed. You see, what's got to happen in the body of Christ? We have to stop looking at the resurrection as a historical event. We are not here today to memorialize the resurrection of Jesus that happened 20, you know, 2,000 years ago. He resurrected from the dead, which means he is alive. And if he is alive, then he is powerful and he is present, praise God. Amen. Glory to God. So Jesus goes to Jairus' house, and there's that 12-year-old little girl laying in the bed. She's dead. She's been dead for, you know, possibly an hour, maybe two hours, not very long. Jesus walks up to her and says, you know, Talitha Makume, he said, you know, I say unto you, rise. And immediately she comes back from the dead. Jesus had prophesied, I'm going to do greater things. Hallelujah. I'm going to do greater things that you may marvel. He said, the day is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. But what was that power? It was the Zoe. It was the Zoe of God. It was the life-giving power of God that was now in Jesus. It was resurrection power. But there's a process, or let me say, a progression that takes place throughout the ministry of Jesus. He starts with Jairus' daughter that had been dead for only a few, few, few hours, and it works. You can see now that, that there's a widening of the possibility in, in the thinking, in the vision. Amen. Because if God can raise up this little girl who's been dead for a few hours, then I think he can do a little bit more. Amen. And so I don't know how long it is after that. Then that Jesus is, is on his journey, and he, and he encounters a funeral procession. It's the widow of Nain's son. They're taking that widow of Nain's son to the graveyard. How long has he been dead? Well, in the culture of that day, they buried within 24 hours. So he's been dead for 24 hours now. He's been dead for one day. Jesus walks up to that, that, that coffin, and he touches the coffin. Hallelujah. And what happens? The man comes back to life. The power flows in him. The man comes back to life. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Then it's then we you know the story, John chapter 11. Here's Lazarus. Lazarus has died. Not only has he died, but they've already buried him. <laughs> Not only is he dead, but he's already buried. He's been dead for four days, which means he's been in the grave for three days. He's been in the grave for three days. That's why Martha said, Lord, he, he stinks by now. You can't roll the stone away. But Jesus said, didn't I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? So they rolled the stone away. Jesus, filled with this life, this glory life, this zoe of God, which is what? Life-giving power, which is the power of the Father. And Jesus speaks down into that dark hole, and he says, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible said, he that was dead came forth bound with grave clothes, alive, four days. Hallelujah. He went from a few hours, 24 hours, to four days. What's Jesus doing? Jesus is conquering death. 
before he himself ever went into the tomb. He has absolutely documented and validated and proven that three days he can do it. Hallelujah. The power is on him. The power is in him. And it's going to work. Amen. And so when they nailed Jesus to the cross, he died and he gave up the ghost. Hallelujah. He gave up the ghost and he died. They buried him. But three days later, Jesus raised from the dead. And he is alive. He is alive. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Glory to God. And we have received him. We have received him. And when we received him, we received Zoe. We received the fullness of life. We received the life in its, in its, in its purest form, the li very life of God. And it transformed us on the inside. And we were changed. Glory to God. And not only will that life save you, but that life will heal you. It has the power to raise, even give life to the dead. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Now, I want to pray for you today. Those of you that are watching me, maybe, maybe your thoughts about Christianity have just been traditional or, or historical. Maybe you're celebrating today the resurrection of Jesus simply because, you know, it's, it's a holiday and it's always been customary in your family. But my question to you today is, is, have you ever received Jesus? Have you ever received him and received this new life, this everlasting life? Maybe you've gone to church and been a good person, but you've never, ever accepted and received Jesus into your life, never received the transformation that comes from receiving everlasting life. Today is the day for you to do that right now. I just want you to bow your heads wherever you are. Just bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want you to pray a prayer. The Bible said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So right there, in the, right there in your living room, right there in your kitchen, wherever you are, just right now, let's lift up your voice and say, Jesus, I call on your name. Save me. Save me. The Bible said, whoever will believe in their heart and confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus shall be saved. Say, say Jesus, be my Savior. Say, Jesus, right now. Say it. Say, Jesus, right now. I repent of my sins. I turn from my sins. I open my heart and I receive you as my Lord and Savior in my life. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, if you prayed that prayer with all of your heart, I just have that, you know, the, the great opportunity of telling you and, and honor of telling you that today Jesus has saved you. He has given to you eternal life. Glory to God. God bless you. And we will see you next Sunday right here online. God bless you. Amen. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wow. Preaching to a bunch of chairs is not easy. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Oh, we got some great, important people here, though. Amen.